I spend my life sitting through countless presentations of strategy, whether it's for a startup, business, or an emerging smart city. So much so that during a Zoom meeting last year, my six-year-old decided to lean in and she just went blah, 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 blah. My daughter has a point though. They all sound the same after a while because everyone claims to have a vision. Everyone wants to win. Strategy is something we all do, whether it's for your career, project, or business, and of course, your life journey. But it's often hard to see what's relevant for you. Strategy is best described as having a clear framework for decision making, starting with your goals, how will you get there, and the actions you need to do to achieve them. But how do you know the decisions you make are the ones that increase the odds of leading you to where you want to be? And if 20 years of being involved in strategy have taught me anything, it is this. Strategy presentations sound the same because people often want to hear something reassuring instead of the truth. There is a very apt quote in the film The Big Shot, which is about the devastating financial crisis of 2008, and it says, Truth is like poetry, and most people hate poetry. So what makes the strategic view of someone who was a champion for design like Steve Jobs so exceptional that Tim Cook said he could see around corners? Apple was a lost cause, a company near bankruptcy in 97, when Steve Jobs returned. Apple had no groundbreaking products, little market influence, yet Steve could see the truth of his industry, that the PC era as it was is being disrupted by the internet and the rise of mobile devices. Steve's vision for a post-PC world paved the way for Apple's dominance. It's now a company with almost $2 trillion in market value. Now, some of you might be wondering, is this thought about design thinking? that step-by-step -step method for design and innovation, popularized by Tim Brown of Ideo. By the way, he gave a wonderful TED talk on that too. The quick answer is no, as there are many pathways to draw on the principles of design for strategy, and I'd like to explore another path with all of you today. However, I must add that there are probably three unfortunate things about the popular myths regarding design thinking. First of all, to clarify with all the conspiracy theories out there, the Global Design Fraternity was not commissioned by 3M to promote this post-it product. Second, I'd like to assure everyone that designers are not trained to think only with post-its. Third, the term design thinking is an odd fit at times, and it seems to suggest that before this concept, design had no strategic thought. It's akin to saying, free gift. I feel strongly about clarifying the strategic value of design because that view changed my life in more ways than one. Realizing the value of design helped me build a global business, discover a whole new way of helping people discover their purpose, gave me the keys to help people define better their strategies to shape their futures. Because even in my own personal journey with design, I did not see the value of design as I did today. I fell in love with design as a craft when my dad bought me my first PC with a color monitor. I was probably the only kid in school who had a color monitor and that made me popular because people did not like playing computer games, seeing green all the time. As for me, other than games, I became enamored with desktop publishing software that was coming out at the time, with software like PageMaker. Playing with the fonts, layouts, and colors was a magical experience. In 1991, as the Gulf War was raging and it was an issue I cared deeply about, I decided to design and print a newsletter on my own to create discussions about war and peace. This caught my teacher's attention. See, I was a nerd, so design soon became this cool hobby I became the go-to guy for design in my school and church. I was designing posters, book covers, and all these came with their privileges such as bonus scores, awards, and free passes. But the best free pass I ever got was while I was serving in the army during national service. One day, the camp commander wanted to create an exhibition to impress a senior commander attending our graduation ceremony. A sergeant, as the Singapore lingo goes, uh, 
arrowed me, saying that I could do it, which is not bad. Because while my friends were marching under the hot sun, I got extra days off to work at home to design the exhibition and meet my girlfriend for dates. So while design was a hobby, I never studied it as I never thought it was helpful other than making something nice. However, when I was about to leave national service, I had a soul-searching moment of what I wanted to do in my life. I'd been involved in an international movement that believed in building a united world. And looking at my past community work, I thought that my contribution to building a better world was to be a Catholic priest, to help people find their purpose through faith. At least that was the vision I wanted to see. Now, before you apply to be a priest in Singapore, it is recommended that you study something practical. So I thought of economics because at that time, there were seismic changes in the world, such as the return of Hong Kong to China in 97. This marked the shift towards Asia as a region on the rise. I remember I had a transmitter radio and I listened to the entire handover ceremony as it happened and I was still serving in the army then. And I dreamed that maybe I could be sent as a priest to China if I knew something useful. The other reason was I was ambitious. You see, I was trying to prime myself to study in Rome, perhaps even serve in the foreign service of the Catholic Church. Probably because of all these vain efforts of trying to strategize my way to becoming an influential priest, that path was never meant to be. Then my dad suggested, why don't you study design since you're so good at it? The insecure, afraid to lose Singaporean in me then retorted, can you even make a living out of it? But being the filial son in me, I went to look for design schools. A few were starting up then, and I applied for one with the past projects that I worked on. I was accepted. So you must know how big hated I was by then since I was supposedly coming to a field I thought I knew very well. One of the first lessons was taught by Mr. Lo Ki Yu, an artist and a pioneer of design education in Singapore. I consider him my Yoda for design. So here I was with him and my wife when I helped launch his exhibition a few years ago. Mr. Lo had asked us to design a poster. I thought this would be easy since I've done it time and again. We're supposed to present our work individually to Mr. Lo. So when it came to my turn, I said my piece. I thought it went well. He took a look at it and asked, what do you see? I was taken aback by his question because I was expecting a quick comment like, you know, change this, that. Feeling somewhat irritated, I gave a half-hearted response implying that it should be obvious. And he posed another question. What did you want people to see? So I told him I wanted people to sense excitement. Then, in a Yoda-like manner, he replied, Your sequence is wrong. If you want people to see what you see, you have to decide what matters most, then graphically determine where they will look first before they can sense it. This lesson changed my view entirely about design. Until Mr. Lowe's fateful lesson, I did not realize the power of design for what it was meant to do. I could consider my design career before Mr. Lowe and after Mr. Lowe. Or you could say, I did not imagine a career in design until that moment. Simply put, Mr. Lo helped me understand the power of design as a method to shape minds, thinking, and approaches. Mr. Lo's thinking greatly influenced me when I eventually built my business once I realized how much impact I could have in people's lives. Because I saw design for not what it could do, but what it could be in helping people to see the truth of their situations and guide their way forward. It became my life's work and my firm's work to figure out how to better help people discern their strategy. We created entire methodologies and approaches simply by understanding how organizations perform through innovation by design. From 20 years of insights and research, from applying the principles of design for strategy, here's what I've learned. And I'm so excited to share it with all of you today. It's probably the simplest of truth and you will probably recognize it. I call it the masterpiece code. Three interlocking yet clear elements make up this code to decipher great strategy. Cause, critique, canvas. These three elements also work in a flow from the clockwise direction and one helps to check the other to help you see the truth. But let us explore the first element, cause. 
Cause is a motive that will motivate you to act. You constantly send something without external prodding that you will keep pursuing. Discovering this motive and examining its existence is crucial for strategic success. So it's not enough to know your purpose. What's the real reason for it? The facts that prove it exists, not just speculation. Just like how Mr. Lowe questioned my motive and pushed me to prove it in my world. This is a critical premise for great strategy. Understanding the cause and showing evidence to prove it matters. Now it turns out it's not a new idea. It's ancient. 15th century maestro Leonardo da Vinci is undoubtedly a trailblazer. And I would argue the father of creative thinking and shape design as a discipline. He was not easily satisfied with simplistic answers or assumptions. He critically tried to observe and understand the world around him, questioning the norms of his time. He sought to marry art and science in his wide-ranging works from the arts to inventing new instruments. He saw that art could be a way to educate people about science. His masterpiece, The Last Supper, was a great example of this. Leonardo's work gave rise to a new genre, a science of painting. Leonardo's course was driven by his scorn for theoretical book knowledge. He preferred irrefutable facts gained from experience, and this became known as sempre vedere, which meant having the art to see. In our work, we discovered sempre vedere is critical in examining how a cause guided actions and decision making. When we examine an organization based on evidence to back up their cause, we find a striking difference in performance. Let us look at present day examples. Just look at SpaceX and Blue Origin. Both companies have similar purposes. Blue Origin started earlier, had a lot more resources. But while Blue Origin spent a lot of time sharing its ideas, concepts for space exploration, SpaceX spent a lot of time exploding things, trying out stuff, using experience to get itself closer and closer to its cause. This also explains why there's a growing gulf between Elon Musk, SpaceX, and its competitors. In daily life, Sempre Vedere could be applied when your friend has been telling you that she really want to begin writing that book, but never started. And your best advice to her is to simply start now and start failing to get closer to her goal. Next is critique. This element is about who you trust as peers, who can honestly give you the feedback you need to hear. Or what other ways can you assess objectively where you are and what you need to do to perfect your understanding of the challenges or issues you face? When I was studying design, this practice was a critical element for success. But first, to subject yourself to critique and learn how to give effective critique. Many people are aware of user-centered design. It's important. But for me, the most critical part of my training as a professional designer was critique. For a great strategy to eventually happen, you need a trusted core of people, friends, who can constantly deliver the necessary truth to improve your product or model. Without it, you cannot achieve breakthrough excellence. Therefore, we often measure who you trust internally to offer advice, critique, and what their practice is like in your culture. In the case of Samsung versus Apple on design infringements, both companies had to present their design processes and cultures. While Samsung had hundreds more designers, it was illuminating that it was done in the spirit of distrust and fear. On the other hand, while Apple had only 17 core designers who had a circle of trust, they were comfortable literally around the kitchen table giving advice and thoughts in the critique of each other. It was a respected core of professionals doing their work. Now, if you were to measure the value of this trusted core and the impact of their work for Apple, you know that critique when done well is valuable. Canvas is the last and crucial element, starting with the limits in mind. Every creative person who wishes to embark on a masterpiece must begin with the end in mind. What's the size of the canvas? What's its material? Its limitations? Then apply their creative skills well to realize its vision accordingly. I often share with fellow entrepreneurs, a great business is never just about the opportunity. It's about knowing the limits of your opportunity, your own limits, and when you have to exit from the game. If you're clear about limitations, you'll be pushed to be creative. In this way, you'll be in a better position to shape a masterpiece, even after you're gone. This 
is the responsibility of a true creative genius. Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks add up to thousands of written notes and sketches, the most voluminous literacy legacy of a creative mind. I find that all my creative friends have the same habit of leaving notes or sketches here and there, either physically or digitally. Yet in one sentence in the margin of one of his last few anatomy sketches, he implored his followers to print his work to make sure that others will build on whatever he has done. He knew what he had started would have some way to go. In our time, Steve Jobs handed the company to Tim Cook, who was not recognized as a creative mind as compared to Johnny Ive, whom Steve Jobs called his spiritual partner. But Steve intuitively knew that Tim would do the things that he could not do. And with that end in mind, to protect probably his most cherished masterpiece, Apple, the company, he trusted Tim to do the right thing. Finally, the canvas you choose to work on should help you connect with your cause, which can only improve with good critique. I hope you are beginning to see the hallmarks of a masterpiece in your strategy. Thank you.